Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Uh, a pleasure to welcome you back to the colloquium, back in face to face and in person. So, uh, nice to see everybody. Um, our speaker today is Professor Jose Castillo, who does not need an introduction, but nonetheless, I have to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Castillo is the founding director of the Computational Science Research Center at San Diego State University. Uh, he's an applied mathematician uh, who does a lot of work with emphasis in numerical solution of PDEs, partial differential equations, scientific computing. Uh, um, So, one of the things that he's really good at is he collaborates very closely with uh, national labs. And in particular, the work that he's done in the genetic discretization method, he's applied it to a variety of applications, ranging from oil exploration, quantum motion modeling. So, truly interdisciplinary, and today he's going to share some of the recent development in memory. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I hope that uh, I can give you uh, at least a clear understanding of what uh, mimetic methods are. Not to switch that. So the, this is a, a brief uh, outline I just put together just for a brief overview of mimetics. I will just try to give a general explanation of what they are and clearly distinguish from traditional methods. Although these are been going on for quite a while already. So then I will give you some examples. And those examples are actually starting from something relatively simple to something very complicated. Some are basically academic examples, and then one that is a real application. And then the last thing, I will give some examples where we look at energy conservation. And the reason is because the method methods are basically um, based of mimetic operators is our discrete analogs of the first order continuum operators that verges grading and curve. So, and for the reason what is called mimetic differences methods are basically numerical schemes that are developed based on these operators. And how and are very efficient to solve partial differences. Okay, so the mimetic difference operators are derived by constructing the discrete analogs of this operator from vector calculus. So this is actually, from the point of view of mathematics, is actually very basic. And this is one thing that we realized is that the most useful uh, theorem in applied mathematics is actually integration by parts, which is a divergent theorem in the abstract, but in one dimension is integration by that's one of the most useful things. And also the chain rule, which is our so, so basic, basic, but they actually could be, become very abstract and have a very range of applications. So they satisfy vector calculus identities. Well, the same identities that the continuum operator uh, satisfy, these discrete analogs in the discrete sense, they also satisfy the same property, which make this schemes more faithful to the physics because basically one we can say that we're doing a discrete vector calculus. That's another way to present it. So they satisfy global and local conservation laws. And these operators in particular that I have developed, they provide uniform order of accuracy at the interior of the domain as well as the boundary. And there's not a single method today that do that. And they're very easy to use. Okay, so one another way to say it is that, for example, in this particular case, D stands for divergence and G for gradient, they satisfy the discrete analog of the divergent theorem 
and they're used to create, design, conservative, reliable numerical representation to continuous models. For example, this is an equation that everybody knows in general. This is actually a Poisson equation, but it's written in terms of the divergence and the gradient. So as long as you can write your equation in terms of divergence and gradient, immediately you can actually use write a discrete analog to that equation. In this case, we have the divergence here, we get the gradient, and this is the equation that we saw. And this equation is a discrete analog of this, and it will produce a very accurate solution. Okay. Okay, so I repeat, they not only provide a uniform order of accuracy when they went to the boundary, but they also satisfy fundamental properties. These are things that we studied in calculus. So you got the gradient of a constant is zero, or there are some conditions for the, the, in the interval, whatever is defined, but the free stream preservation basically tells you the divergence of the constant vector is also zero. And by the way, there are examples, you can construct examples where you got a function that is constant and you use finite difference methods and you approximate the derivative and you don't get zero, okay? That never happened with mimetic method. So also the curl of the gradient is zero, the divergence of the curl is zero and the divergence of the gradient give you the Laplace. You cannot write finite difference, you can approximate Using matrices, which is these are matrices representation, you can construct, let's say, the equivalent of divergence and the equivalent of a gradient, but they don't satisfy these properties. Also, we have done, I believe all of us, are solve the Poisson equation using finite differences. So you are you do an approximation to the Laplace. However, you cannot take the Laplace and, and decompose into a divergence and a gradient. And one of the most important thing is that these operators divergence and gradient, they satisfy an ex uh, discrete extended Gauss divergent theorem. That's actually very, very important. Okay, now these uh, operators are constructed on staggered meshes, or staggered grids. So traditionally, you know, find the difference are created using what is called a nodal grid. So you, let's say, take an interval, you divide it, and every point is a node, and that's where you do the approximation. These uh, operators are constructed on a staggered mesh, where we, another way is to say, if it's like basically you have two meshes, one on top of the other, but, basic, but then in here, we distinguish, for example, the scalars are represented in the center of the cells and in the boundary, and the vector quantities in the edges or faces. Okay, uh, von Neumann actually said that the, I don't know if you remember, it, the soul of applied mathematics is a computer program that you can use to show what you can, what you're doing. Well, the evolution these days is a library. So we actually have a library which is called MOL, nothing to do with chemistry, although the chemist, the, the chemist uh, people love it. But it's basically this high quality. We have C and C++. And this is a library that provides all these operators instead of having to program all of them. So you can actually use the library to write your own code. It's very efficient. Is uh, on GitHub, and this was uh, developed by uh, Johnny Corvino, and uh, and then is being added by other uh, students. And the first paper actually that that I published was uh, with uh, Bob Brown in 2003, where we came up with a representative representation, basically to all the operators with the properties. That was the first time that was written from the mathematical point of view. So that's a, 
And, and, this, and then in, the, in this paper, we constructed second order operators, fourth order and sixth order divergence and gradient. And one detail in this one is that, for example, for the fourth order operators, then every operator had three free parameters. And there are some people who have studied those parameters in terms of stability, also in terms of the bandwidth of the matrix. But then Johnny did it again, and in 2020, he actually uh, developed a method to construct the, the operators, which are the look a little different than the other ones, but these operators are optimal. They don't have any free parameters. The bandwidth is optimum. And when we compare the two, you can use the two to solve the same problems. In the worst case, they have the same address. But in general, it's more accurate and there is no need to deal with parameters. Okay, here, uh, these are the baby operators in 1D second order. This is the equivalent, I guess, there is no the divergence in 1D, but you know, for abuse of language and because we actually are going higher dimensions, we call this a divergence. But this is the equivalent metric representation of divergence in one dimension. And this one is the equivalent of the grid in one dimension. Now this satisfied all the properties that I mentioned before, so when you solve problems with this and you compare that with find the difference, this is, there is no match. Okay. And the, I will show some examples where the, basically uh, we highlight how powerful, reliable and versatile these this, uh, schemes are. And by using the library, you don't have to write different calls every time. So you actually have to just call the operators that you need. Okay. Now, we also can go to higher dimensions. And this is a commercial here. So the, we have using uh, Kronecker products, we can actually go from 1D to 2D and 3D. No problem. And by the way, the library provides 1D, 2D, and 3D, you don't even have to do the parameter process. And everything is done with a metric, a sparse metric representation, which now, one of the things that we're doing now is looking at how efficient is to solve the systems that come up at the end. So if you're solving a linear problem, we're gonna solve a, a linear system of equations at the end. If there is a nonlinear, it's gonna be a nonlinear system. So we're looking now in having, what is the most effective way to solve this sequentially and in this distribution. Okay. So right now we do have the sequential part taken care of and we're about to finish the, the distributed part, which it will be also another addition to the library. Okay, so the examples that I'm gonna show are just, one is the Berger's equation, and the reason to show this, this is actually an example that everybody who wants to develop schemes work on. Because it's nonlinear, it has a shock, okay? Now, this is not a capturing shock scheme, but I could use it combined with something else. Using a second order, there is no way you can capture the shock. However, when we compare the mimetic uh, scheme, second order, with a second order in time, which it happened to be, I call it mimetic, which is basically staggering time, need to now to be like a mimetic leapfrog. When I do, when we do that, and we compare with last Wendro or we, any other method, the mimetic, this mimetic uh, scheme, follows the solution, keeps the peak all the way till it breaks. There's no other, none of the other methods get that close. Now, if we do a higher order, which we haven't implemented, six, probably four or six, we should be able to capture the shot. 
with enough resolution. Oh, you have a question, but we can answer that later. Okay, so here is a burger's equation. And basically, all we can see here, I used to have all other methods together, but it, this is just easy to see. The, the, the whole thing is that it goes all the way, keep going, and keeps the peak right till the thing breaks. Yes. Okay. Now, this was second order in time and space. Now, what about higher order? I, there are people who complain that, and we reason, that when you start doing higher order, find a different type method, the stencil increases, which is the difference between final element type method. So, and some people develop something which is called compact finite difference. Where they be, there is a factorization, and then they are able to increase the order using smaller steps. Okay, so I finally read one paper that discussed this, and I came up with a way to do our factorization with a very important detail, which is that when you do compact finite differences, and I believe that Ron here uses that all the time. You actually, is, you don't get a local map. You actually have to solve a three-diagonal system. However, when we do the mimetic discretization, we don't solve the system. So it's only matrix multiplication. So it's local. And you can trace the stencil, what, what the elements are used, and it's all local, which is an advantage. So we can factor the matrices, and at the end, you're using only the second-order stencil to solve the problem of higher uh, order. Okay, the next example is also not very difficult. And this is a linearized 3D acoustic wave equation. The story behind this is that when we are, uh, if we're going to solve a problem which has a Hamiltonian structure, the Methods to use for integration is called symplectic method. So, what happens if your method doesn't have Hamilton structure? Well, we actually look at the acoustic uh, wave equation. We turn out that you doing some substitution and manipulation, you can transform this into a problem that has an associated Hamilton structure. So in this particular case, we wrote this and we got a semi-descript system written in this form and which can be uncoupled. And then you get a system of equations for the pressure and for the velocity. For this case, we use symplectic. Okay, so let's see if this works. So, okay, this one is called position, actually this one is you know who did this was Newton. And he said the principia is that uh, with the diagram and all the stuff. They call it position Newton Berlet sometimes, but this is a coronary scheme. And this is called this is for a root. This is a fourth order. They're both symplectic. So we use both to, to solve the, the problem. And for this particular case, like I said before, the system can be rewritten in a different way and it's written this. So then we actually manufacture a solution. I don't know if you ever done that, but this is actually a very standard thing to test your skill. The first time you write a code, what is the first thing you wanna know? To see if you get the right answer. And how do you know that? You try a problem, you run out of know the answer. And to do that, you start with the solution the problem and go back and construct the PDA that you, that you, that you do. That's your standard way. And that always works. If your method doesn't recover that, then I guess you have to go back to the drawing. Okay, so we manufacture a solution. 
we put uh, initial condition use, using the, the manufacturer solution, we set up the initial conditions. In this case, the pressure was subjected to a homogeneous directly boundary condition. And each scalar component of the velocity satisfy a scalar wave equation for each one of the phases with Robin boundary conditions. So, and the domain was the Q with the four, four, uh, zero to four pi. Okay, here is the result for the pressure. This is nothing surprising, but it's important, at least to me, is that we get fourth order, okay? This is for a root, which is fourth order in time, mimetic fourth order in space, and we got fourth and fourth. That's pretty nice, okay? Uh, the next is the velocity field. And this is really nice. This is a nice movie uh, done by Angel who defended his dissertation you know, like a month ago. Okay, and this is what is nice about this is you can see the the vector field changing and the solution going to restore to a sink and it's going around all the time. So it's, you're actually getting the solution. Okay, the conclusion for this example is you know, for the is that we combine high order mimetics with symplectic methods, and we are able to solve problems with Hamiltonian structure associated with it. And the advantage of the, the symplectic methods, they're globally stable. So there's no problem with stability. So that's, uh, that's actually nice. And actually very, very uh, inexpensive. That's another thing. It's very, they're very, very easy to implement. We do have in the library some examples. Okay, so, oh, by the way, there is a detail that it, to me is very important. A lot of the people who do finite elements, uh, discontinuous color, can they always find the weak solution. And we actually find the strong solution. Okay, so. Next. okay. So this is an example also uh, ba basically just to illustrate that we can use in an irregular domain using curvilinear coordinates, we can actually solve problems. And we actually are in the process of finishing a paper because in this one we prove or demonstrate that the properties are maintained also in curvilinear coordinates. And also the boundary operator is the same, doesn't change, which is also very nice. And so everything is done on the computational domain. Now, this has limitations because you have to generate a mesh and this mesh could become very complicated, but there are other options. Okay, this, this example, I'm just going to comment on this because this is, well, I wasn't the first, but, but this is the first real application which wasn't done here. So it was done in collaboration with a geophysics group at this um, Barcelona Supercomputing Center in Spain. And they work uh, with uh, Repsol, which is an oil company, and they do oil exploration. And all kinds of stuff. So I went there, I gave a talk, and then we have a discussion. And based on that, I constructed operators that were eighth order in the interior and fourth in the boundary. They implemented their scheme and the whole idea for this, well, this was published this paper in this uh, journal and was basically, in the problem is, is a tough one. So the, the basically the idea is to compare and find out how do different schemes handle complexity. So here, there is in this table, you can see that if there is a, the, the, the model, it's a smooth velocity model, the conventional finite difference, by the way, the one that is in the notes, but also there are people who implement staggered finite difference, which are non mimetic but they're staggered. And it's compared with high order finite element, including finite element and discontinuous color. So, 
everything is fine. And this is true for every problem. If the problem is easy, all the methods work. When the problem start getting complicated is when you can start to distinguish which methods is better for something. Okay, so rough structures, which is basically the topography. Uh, sorry, the inside the, the, the domain. This is before we de the, they developed the scheme based on the operator that I just said. So conventional find a different, I don't know what pass this is a C or, or is it or, or is it B? But they put it a, a minus. In past, in stagger for anything, the plus in past, but the high order final element you can see handles everything no problem. And it's operative, conventional find the difference surprisingly was okay. Visco elasticity was okay, weight contents, you know, this is basically a state of the art at that moment. And there are some pictures of this, this is, was a whole talk. So i just given you a teaser here. Okay, so the way that you look at this is, well, high, high order finite element like metal, they can handle better complexity than finite. And that has to do with the way the finite element theory is. So you assume that you can write a solution as a linear combination of basic functions, and then you implement those in different, uh, Cells, I guess I don't remember how they call it in this moment. Elements. Okay, then the high order finite elements like metal, they require less memory because they have better edge adaptivity than the finite difference. So that's easy to do all kinds of things. They're very hard to implement if you want to write a real code. Okay? So, so the finite different methods are very easy to write. So they're easier to port. Okay. And optimize in new computer architecture, GPUs, and all kinds of things. And they actually did that for this. Okay. Another thing that is very important is an isotropy. And this is something that not all the methods actually really capture it. And this is pressing everywhere when you're starting to do interesting problems. So the causes to the heterogeneity of the material, mineral properties, stresses applying the material. And the observability is usually the shield waste clearing when you change direction. And that's something that is very hard to track. And they're located everywhere. So in particular, we are concerned about the bottom of the ocean and also in the upper mountain. But there are all kinds of problems. So if you methods is able to capture that, I think you're in this. Okay, so what happened after they develop their scheme? The picture changed. They have now a new column. We made it full, full stagger, find a difference, they call it. But it's a, a, the important thing here is if when you look at that column, it's basically, it's only three, it's okay, the color K, except with one. And this has to do with the implementation they did, because in this particular case, they deformed the, the geometry, the topography, but it's not totally, I mean, it's, it's uh, still compared to a very rough, when you have, uh, there's a cliff or something like that, it's very hard to get. So they were not able to capture that. But in general, they were able to reproduce the, the same features that the discontinuous Galerkin methods of order 16 or something was able to do. And the most important part, at least uh, to me, which was, I was surprised, but pleasant to surprise. They, they were 17 times less expensive, faster than this continuous galerk for those. And they ported these to GPUs and meters. And they use it as a production. Okay. Now the next one has to do a little bit with okay, irregular geometry, basically. What do you do? For example, if your domain is topologically equivalent to a rectangle. You can imagine, uh, well, now the erasers, you can fold them, but you cannot erase, erase or you can fold them, put it on top of your domain, then 
full bilingual content will work great. But that doesn't happen in a lot of programs. So then in this particular case, we're gonna show you this example, which is again, it's an easy one to manufacture solution, but with a geometry that is, uh, is, is easy, but it could be applied to different things, which is what is called overlapping grids, which is basically a system where you have several grids and then you solve everything in the computational domain. And even the computational domain, you do interpolations when it's needed because the, the, you have a system of grids that overlap. Okay, so here is a picture of an overlapping grid system in a channel. So basically you're solving the, the, the problem in, in this, in this channel, this actually is the way that depicted there, but it's, I believe it's just a missile that is going through something. Okay, so, but then what is important here is that all the overlapping things are not considered boundaries. See, in a, I think I have read papers where they create like an artificial boundary to be, here you just need to, the solution has to travel across the part where there is the interpolation. And that's done, and that's what the, the trick or the thing that they have developed uh, works really well. This part, by the way, the, uh, the only thing that, uh, this was again, was my student, and the only thing that he took was the, he created a mesh with the overlapping, there's a code that is available, and uh, he took the mesh, but then he uh, used this with the library, combined it with the library, and so on. Okay, and here are the results. Again, what is important for us is that we were able to solve, this is a problem that they solved, we were able to solve the same problem, and the order is fourth order. So even with the interpolation, of course, this is actually not that difficult, but again, it shows that you're able to solve the problem. Okay, now time and space met in different methods. And I just call it time and space because as we know, all these operators are constructed in space. You know, there's no time in divergence or the gradients or verb space. But we want to solve time dependent problems. So we do have to use a scheme, the time integration to combine those two. Okay, so we also have demonstrated, demonstrated that the mimetic different operators conserve energy in space. Okay, so you write a problem and then you write it in terms of the operators you construct the equivalent of the energy equation and then do some calculation and at the end you show that the energy doesn't change. So it's, it's concerned. Okay, so what we do in time? If we have a Hamiltonian structure, then we use symplectic integration. So it's very hard to beat symplectic integration. We are now actually comparing Two method, two schemes uh, with uh, one scheme with symplectic integration in terms of efficiency of different things. But it's very hard to beat symplectic integration because it's globally stable and it's actually very easy. I mean, the implementation is very simple. Okay. Now, I mentioned what I call mimetic leap block, which is basically a mimetic in space and staggering time. So far we have we done with the standard uh, second order. My plan is actually to see if we can construct a fourth order, staggering time, which is a, like I said, uh, will be like a fourth order leaf rock. But also I would like to write it in compact form. So like, the, like we do it for the space. Okay. And, this is the layers, which is, uh, that's actually the, what is called relaxation room And this is uh, actually 
a collaborator that I've known for many years and every time I see him in conference with this course about this and, and then I run into him again in a conference four years ago and he said, I think I, I got what you need. Okay, so he sent me a paper. So then one of our students started implementing, you know, reading the paper and implementing the thing and we got it. So here is a simple example. This is a 1D advection equation. And in this particular case, he used a weaker method with the relaxation room Gakuta and the method with relaxation room Gakuta. So this is just a convergence error. This is actually a very simple problem, but you know, again, you start solving the simple one to illustrate if the method works. And here are the results. For example, you got the RK, which is the standard room Gakuta, the RRK is relaxation room Gakuta. Okay. So, so we have here the L2. Uh, oh, okay, this is for okay, so now we got it. Relax uh, Room Gakuta, infinity norm, relaxation room Gakuta, infinity norm, and room Gakuta with L2 and uh, relaxation room Gakuta. As you can see the difference in the, well, this is a weaker method and this is a method. So we, we do get slightly better in terms of accuracy. But when you take two methods which are the same order, of approximation, there are still uh, differences in the accuracy. They're globally, they're both second order, but one is more precise. Than one. So we got a little better, but then the next one is, is more important because is we actually do an energy norm, which is actually a construction in this case because there is no energy from the physics point of view in that action. But in this particular case, this is what we got, is that the energy evolution in the mimetic uh, relaxation room recruiter, okay, here, is, how do you call it, conserve too much imprecision. Okay. You can enforce in this particular, with this particular scheme, how precise do you want the energy to be conserved? So it costs a little more, but you can say, okay, I want this. And then you can make it to energy to machine precision is that's what is required. Okay. okay. This one is a 1D wave equation. And this particular case is, uh, how do you call it? Uh, this PEFRL is performance enhanced forest roof. Okay, so here that we have the mimetic with RK4, and then we have the mimetic with relaxation RK4. You can see there is some difference. Okay, this one stays there, okay. Okay, here is the energy evolution, and we can see again. And this particular case was compared also with the totally variation diminishing uh, scheme, which I don't know if people use it today, but that was uh, the times when they developed this was like, you know, like machine learning today. Uh, so we got the relaxation room Gakuta, again, accurate to machine precision. So what can I say about it? Well, the combination with the high order magnetic methods with the relaxation room Kakuta conserve energy in space and time to machine precision. The magnetic methods are structure preserving and they conserve energy. Combined with the relaxation room Kakuta, they actually conserve energy in time. So if we don't have 
And we say, if we have a problem that doesn't have a Hamiltonian structure, then at the moment, this is the method that if I want to use high order, if I want to use second order, we met the leaf flow. I mean, that's conserve everything, stable and accurate. Okay, in summary, Numerical schemes based on mimetic difference operator are more faithful to the physics of the problem under investigation. They have been used effectively in several applications, from simple hyperbolic equation to distress proper transport, transport to reactive chemical compound. And the use of mimetic different methods not only provide higher accuracy and consistency with physical laws, but they also are versatile, highly reusable for implementation of technology. In addition, which is the last thing that we've been doing lately, we make the different skins combined with the relaxation room that put the metals conserve energy and space. And like I mentioned before, the library actually is, for us, is unbeatable. We even compare, this is going to be on record, so I don't know, but we have even compared with MATLAB because we have a MATLAB version and we got more, better results. Okay, next please. Okay, these are some uh, the, the latest publications and some that are coming. And I want to acknowledge uh, the people who did the work, which is uh, Johnny Corbino, Angel Boada, who finished it. Uh, Johnny is actually graduated a few years ago and now is a postdoc here for one more year. And uh, also uh, teaching Come six, seven, they had the scientific computing class in the spring. And Anand Srinivasan is the one who's been doing the, in the relaxation room that we've done. So, uh, this, semester, this semester, he's in his, starting his second year. Okay. And uh, I, I think in the, in the outline, I forgot to put here the next step, which is Eureka. I don't know if you're familiar with Eureka, right? What can you tell me about Eureka? No, no, no. That was, that, that was Archimedes. The Eureka is actually a bar here, a restaurant. Right when, and then after the colloquium, we usually go there to have a beer. So that's after this is Eureka. There's a question from the chat. Okay. So what is the question from the chat? What do the gradient of the scalar leaf from the cell center or space center or full depot depending on the context? No, it's not depending on the context. They live always in the same place. They still in the center of the cells is during 1D and the boundary, always boundary and center. And also faces and boundary or edges, edges, boundaries or faces. So all consistent from one to three D or from uh, all, uh, all. sorry, I, I uh, go ahead on me. Yeah, so yeah. I think I'm hearing you. Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, so in that point, imagine you are solving Navier Stokes equation. So your velocities are on phase centers and your pressure is on cell center, but you want to define the pressure gradient. So shouldn't the pressure gradient be defined on the faces rather than cell centers to make the equation consistent? You have to, uh, how do you call it? So if, if one quantity is not in the place where the other one is, we actually have to do some interpolation to bring it to the place. So does that, does that mean that in certain contexts you can actually lose physics because you are requiring interpolation? Interpolation uh, may not guarantee that physics is respected, right? So that goes back to the same problems that finite differences have, right? Well, so far we haven't had that problem. Okay. But it, it could happen in certain contexts that interpolation may uh, obviate all the physics that mimetic differencing is trying to achieve. Like I said, we, so far we haven't had that problem. We have to look at a particular case. 
Okay. All right. Uh, I have another question. Uh, you showed an example of Berger's uh, equation. So the convective operator, how did you define that? Was that defined just as regular differencing or you were also doing some like uh, limit, limiters on convective field? Uh, we only use the operators. We didn't do anything else. Okay. And you were still, but in the, but when you run into shock, so, so you were showing shock. No, 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 no. I wasn't capturing the shock. I was showing that the extreme followed the solution right till the shock comes. So, okay. So when the shock comes, so after the shock comes, so does your, does your simulation blow up? I would expect it to, to blow up if you are- They all blow up. But what I'm saying is that the point for that exercise was to show that the mimetics keeps the peak, maintains the peak, and the other one, the other method don't. They, they fail before reaching the shock. Hmm. Um, I, I think we like in regular CFD, we do Burger's equation and we can mimic the shocks very well. Uh, like that's even, even if you run, to run no, into- but that's different. I'm not trying to capture the shock. I was just trying to make a point about following mm -hmm. the solution till the shock. I can capture the shock also if I want. But I would your simulation to... remain stable in the when you run into shocks? Yeah, but that, like I said, that's a different. That's a different problem. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to switch up and have somebody else. The room has questions. Uh, room. Mm -hmm. When you say staggering in time, do you mean that the scalars? Or different time no. vectors? No, no, is that is that uh, basically a predictor corrector type that you match? Okay. It's no, it's not in the nodes. You actually do half. Right, okay. yeah. No, the, the, everything else is stay the same in the space. It's just that, for okay. example, you go, you're gonna go from from zero to one, then you go to half. If you you stagger different quantities in time. Yes, uh, I can show it to you. Thank you. No, no, the whole thing is you just you do the half time. Yes, time. yes. Right. Okay. Uh, that I can show to you. That's actually works very well. And then at the end, you end up with a with a matrix equation that you can solve for the whole thing. We do that too, but our velocities are. Something new. Uh, wait. Maximize that screen and. Yeah. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, we have. Uh, so we can solve problems with Neumann boundary conditions. There's some answers on the Uh, that I don't know. Is it correct that the spectral methods can be a special case of a mimetic algorithm? That's what I was saying that I don't know. But you can move that from G, 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 G. Did we apply to inelastic solid mechanics? Uh, we need to talk. Do you maintain your boundary accuracy with Dirichlet conditions instead of random? So that again? If you have Dirichlet conditions on your boundaries, do you still maintain your accuracy on the boundary? Are the coefficients modified on the near boundary? No, we don't modify anything. That's, that's the beauty. The coefficients are the same all the time, they don't change. Do we have other questions for Professor Castillo? Anybody online? They left to Eureka already. All right. If not, let's thank Professor Castillo for the <laughs>